Hey everyone, welcome back. This is week 35 of Our Mothers Knew It. And this week we get to venture into the chapters of Helaman. So Helaman and his son named Helaman are going to tell us more about what the Nephite people are like at this time before Christ. In fact, I feel like you can almost see Mormon setting the stage. He's this incredible gifted editor who's deliberately choosing what parts of the, these plates to hold on to. And I feel like, especially in this week's chapters, you see him preparing our hearts for what will happen in 3 Nephi when the Savior comes. Because you see all kinds of turmoil. You see times of intense darkness. You see these bright pillars of light that cut through that darkness. And it's almost like Mormon is trying to help us prepare I also think the story that we're going to study this week about Lehi and Nephi, these sons of Helaman Jr., who have this moment in a prison where there's darkness and there's a pillar of light and there are missionaries that are unexpected who go out and change the landscape of the Nephite and Lamanite people. Like This is almost a preview or a foreshadowing, maybe, of what will happen in 3rd Nephi. And to me, the reason it's so powerful is because I feel like this is also a foreshadowing of our day. Whenever the Savior is going to come again, there will be times of darkness, and there will be these opportunities to see bright pillars of light. And so to watch for them in this week's chapters helps us watch for them in our own life as we prepare for this time when the Savior will come again. And I just thought it was rich and full. It's almost like I read a book once all about how to write a really great story. And it talked about how that you have to have cool settings and you have to have rich character arcs and you have to have these bright contrasts to catch people off guard and weird plot twists that people don't see coming. You get all that this week, you guys. This is a week of intrigue and setting the stage and these bright moments that will take your breath away. I think you're going to love it. Grab your scriptures, grab your notes. It's time to get started. If you're new here, let me help you get familiar. Basically, I'm going to give you nine things that I loved about this week's chapters, and I'm going to teach them to you in three different ways. So first, we're going to cover some sparks. These are just new ideas or fresh insights that came to me as I dug into the verses this week. And then I'm going to give you three questions. These are just conversation starters or things to kind of prompt your scripture study as you head into your own scriptures to find answers. And then I'll do a second video of three object lessons. These are just creative kickstarts, things to catch your kids off guard so that you can take some of the principles that you love about these chapters and find cool ways to teach them to the rising generation. Okay, so before we get into the sparks though, let me give you a summary of what you're going to find in the chapters. I don't cover everything, so this will hopefully at least help you understand what's coming at you. So let's begin in Helaman 1. That's where you're going to find out what happens to Bohoran's sons. And you guys... For somebody like Pahoran that is so noble and so good, to, to find what you find in Helaman 1 is just disheartening. Because essentially, Pahoran ages and it's time for him to pass the judgment seat on. And there is a division among the people about which of his sons should receive that judgment seat. And that division among the people causes all three of those sons to die within 22 verses. So you're going to see that contention build up and... This is where you get the very beginnings of the Gadian robbers. So you're going to see two different bad guys in chapter one. First, you're going to see Kish Kuman. He's a different kind of bad guy. He's one that kind of like sneaks in. He'll murder people on the judgment seat and then slink away. And he just has a different method of attack than the other bad guy. Coriantumr is what I would call like a smash and grab bad guy. He's more of that... You know, like he comes in when there's a crisis happening and he just like marches into the middle and takes what he wants. Like he's that kind of bad guy. And you see the beginnings and the endings of both of those men within these first chapters. So that's Helaman 1. That sort of plants the seeds for what will happen in Helaman 2. Because this is where you start to see the growth of the Gadianton robbers. There is a man named Gadianton, or at least he's called that in the verses. And he sort of picks up the pieces that were left behind by these other bad guys and brings this secret band to a whole nother level. He's like the Marlon Brando level bad guy. He, ha he has a, a longer game in mind and he does things differently. He gathers up what's left of Kish Kuman's band and they do awful things all throughout this week's chapters and really, frankly, all throughout the rest of the Book of Mormon. So you'll see some of that, his attempts to overthrow the government and how he pulls that off. You also see what stands in his way, and that is Helaman the Younger. So Helaman's son, Helaman, is the chief judge, and he is he gets in their way. And because of that, he has a target on his back, and Gadianton and his band want to get Helaman out. And so you're going to see some of that intrigue play out there. Three is a little different. Three is when you find out that there's a mass exodus that occurs. 
So this is kind of odd. We don't have a lot of answers about why people move, but it seems like maybe they're sick of the wars. Maybe there's some sort of famine in the land. We don't really know, but a large number of Nephites travel north and they settle in a place that doesn't have much tree. It doesn't have much, you know, anything. It seems to have a place where you could build with cement and with limited resources, but they travel up there. This includes like the people of Ammon. They all travel up north. In four, things shift a little bit. This is where you find Helaman's sons coming into the story. So this is Nephi and Lehi, and they're these incredible, mighty men of valor. Like they just, clearly they've inherited traits from their dad and from their grandpa and great grandpas. Like they have this incredible line and they are stepping up to the plate, you guys. They are going to be these missionaries for the Lord. First, they have positions of power. They step down from those in order to teach the word and they do it beautifully. It just gets them into some trouble sometimes because the, there's a lot of people that don't like it when you teach the word. And so when you get into Helaman 5, this is when you find that they're in prison. It's the exact same prison that we read about with Ammon. So not like chopping off the arms Ammon, but the Ammon, the Ammon that was from the city of Zarahemla, that Ammon, when he was went to like visit Limhi's area and he gets captured, that's the same prison. So this is like a hundred year old prison and it's got a whole bunch of people in it and they have this incredible foreshadowing moment that you'll just love of all of the chapters don't skip chapter five this week because that's when you see the most illuminating prison break of any story in the whole book of mormon i love helam and five and then six is where you see the outcome of that this is when the tables start to turn and the Lamanites now are preaching to the Nephites. Like the Lamanites are starting to be converted to such a degree that they are going out with power and authority to teach the word. It kind of begins with the prisoners who escape and who have seen this miracle, but it spreads like wildfire and there's a lot of beautiful things that come from it. The only sad part about that is, is you also learn in six that while there is some thriving that happens among the people and the divisions between Nephites and Lamanites are starting to erode, you also have this band of Gadian that is growing under the surface, that they are thriving under this cover of secrecy and their secret combinations, and they sneak out at just really precise times. And by the end of six, they have conquered the Nevite government. Like they've taken over the capital city of Zarahemla and they have their sights set on much bigger areas. And it, you kind of get that stage set by this week's chapters so that when we come into next week, you can learn more about what they accomplished. But that'll kind of give you a summary of what you're facing. Now let's get into the sparks. Spark number one, I call Helaman and Hannah, because I love these two stories side by side. Admittedly, Hannah's always been one of my favorite scripture stories. It's why we named our oldest daughter Hannah, because I love the offering that she gives. If you remember her story from the Old Testament, she's the one that comes and she desperately wants a child. There are others who are having children around her and her whole heart aches for a child. And so she goes to the temple to pray. And in that prayer, a priest comes out and promises her, this high priest promises that she will indeed have a child. And the moment I love most about Hannah's story is when she goes, like she leaves the temple grounds and her countenance is no more sad. She doesn't have a fulfillment of the promise yet. There's nothing different about Hannah yet, except that she has a promise from God and she believes it. And so she goes away rejoicing. And of course, the promise is fulfilled. She receives and has this son. What's incredible about her is that she as soon as he's born, and probably the whole pregnancy, knows that that son needs to return to the Lord at some point in time. So she raises him in a particular way. At least that's how I've always pictured it. If you know at some point you're going to have to turn this son back over to the Lord and let him be raised at the temple by Eli, then what do you think her mothering looked like? I just love the way it's phrased. One of the things you learn about Hannah is that even after she brings Samuel to the temple and gives him to Eli. She never leaves him behind. He is her son, her firstborn son, and she gets to come visit him once a year at the temple. And I love the verse about it. So this is 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 19. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year. And when she came up with her husband to offer yearly sacrifice. First off, I love that this is part of scripture. You know, like this, it's her one moment to see her son in the year. And what she does is she makes him a little coat. And I just, if it were me, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this as parents who have sent kids on missions or sent them off to college or wherever, if you're only going to see your kid for a very short period of time, what would you 
put in that coat? You know, I found myself wondering, what would she stuff the pockets with? Maybe she's like my mom and she stitches things into the lining of the coat so that her son knows he is loved and remembered. And, you know, the, the, the words that are most important to her, I could see her putting into that coat somehow. And the reason that came to mind in this week's study is because I see something really similar with Helaman's story. So in Hannah's story, if you look at 20 and 21, what you find out is there's this phrasing that's really similar to what you see in Helaman. So this is 20. And Eli blessed Elkanah, her husband, and his wife, meaning Hannah, and said, the Lord give thee the seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. Meaning when she brings Samuel back, she is blessed with this gift that she will have more children. She It's the phrase, the loan that was lent to the Lord that I love. And then 21, it gets even better. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. This is what it looks like to raise your children unto the Lord. It means I think Hannah had the mindset from the very beginning that this son is mine, but he's not mine first. He's God's first. And how can I raise him to be God's son? I think there is something powerful about that stance in parenting. When we choose to say, you are mine, but my job is to raise you to remember that you're his first. You are a daughter of God. You are a son of God. And I think that would have colored every part of her motherhood. You see the same thing with Helaman and his wife. You know, almost the same phrasing. This is Helaman 3, 20 and 21. Nevertheless, Helaman did fill the judgment seat with justice and with equity, and he did observe to keep the statutes and the judgments and the commandments of God. And he did do that which was right in the sight of God continually. And he did walk after the ways of his father, insomuch that he did prosper in the land. And it came to pass that he had two sons, and he gave unto the eldest the name of Nephi, and unto the youngest the name of Lehi, and they began to grow up unto the Lord. I love that phrase. I feel like it's the, almost the exact same one we heard with Hannah. It's, it seems that Helaman and his wife have this mindset that their sons, they don't just want happiness for them. They don't just want a nice full life for their sons. They want their sons to remember that they are God's sons first. And so they raise them unto the Lord almost expecting that at some point they're going to turn these sons over to the Lord the same way that Hannah did with Samuel. I think this inevitably happens at different points in our life as our kids age, you know, and we have to kind of like send them off with their connection to the Lord. I've started to think that what it means to raise children unto the Lord means to take the trust that I inherently get as a mother and to use it to help them trust their heavenly parents. Like if I can take that gift of trust that God has blessed every child with as they are coming into this world and use it for that purpose, all kinds of things happen. The reason I think this is such a cool sacrifice for the Helaman and his wife to make. First, I think they only have two sons. You know, like compared to like Pahoran, who says he has many sons, Helaman just has these two. And he gives them both unto the Lord. He raises them with the expectation that they're going to do things for God. What's powerful about that to me is Helaman's essentially raising them so that they can be mighty leaders among the Nephites and also powerful missionaries. And both of those things will put their sons in danger. Helaman himself has had a target on his back the whole time he's been chief judge. The Gadianton robbers are trying to kill Helaman on the throne. So to raise your son Nephi, expecting him to take that same like place on this throne to like judge the people righteously, you know, like, can you imagine what that would feel like on your heart? But they're being raised to the Lord. I think Helaman and his wife know that these are not their sons first. These are God's sons first, and he needs them to be leaders, and he needs them to be powerful missionaries. So they raise them unto the Lord. I love the way it's phrased in 37. And it came to pass that in the 50 and third year of the reign of the judges, Helaman died, and his eldest son Nephi began to reign in his stead. And it came to pass that he did fill the judgment seat with justice and equity. Yea, he did keep the commandments of his father, and he walk in the ways of his father. The reason I like this is I feel like this is that point, ultimately, that all of us will return our kids to the Lord, right? When we are no longer there, this is when we have to hope that the words we have stitched into the linings of their hearts will be visible and memorable, right? Like, I, you know, if you picture Hannah and Samuel pulling the things out of the pockets of that little coat or reading what's embroidered into the lining, I feel like that must have happened with these two sons. Because look at the rest of the chapter. You guys, the whole thing is them telling you what they remember about what their dad said. 
it's like the stripling warriors, but with a dad. They remember the words of their father. I mean, look at them. There's a whole bunch, but here's just a few that you can find in chapter five. Behold, I have given you the names. Remember, this is after Helaman died, when his sons are remembering his words. I have given you the names of our first parents who came out of the land of Jerusalem. And this I've done, that when you remember their names, you remember your names, you will remember them. And that when you remember them, you remember their works. And when you remember their works, you may know how that it is said that, and also written that they were good. He and his wife give them names that will outlive that parent-child connection. Their names are with them always. It's embroidered onto their hearts so that they can always remember when anyone says their name, who they are and who they represent and the kind of men their parents want them to be. You get even more in eight. This is where Helaman reminds them, don't worry about the day-to-day life. Build up treasures in heaven. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. That which is eternal, which fadeth not away. Yea, that you may have a precious gift of eternal life. Somewhere, because his sons remember it here, it means it's stitched into their hearts somewhere, and they can pull it out when it's needed. Nine is when he testifies of the atoning nature of Jesus Christ and how he is the only access point to this kind of salvation that's been stitched into their hearts. Twelve is when he talks about the rock, right? It's this epic verse where he talks about, remember, remember, my sons, that it's upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that you must build your foundation. I don't know how Helaman and his wife were able to get these sayings or these incredible verses stitched into the hearts of their sons. And I don't know how Hannah raised a son like Samuel to be the kind of son that he grew up to be. But I really think the crux of it is the same. It means choosing this mindset of, I am raising my children unto the Lord. I am raising them in a way that will expect that someday, whether it's in this life as they leave for small journeys, or at the end of my life when they are on their own in a bigger way, that at that point, they're prepared. Their hearts are ready because they've been raised unto the Lord. There was this interesting parallel as I was studying the New Testament, the Old Testament, and the Book of Mormon this week. And I started to see that story of John the Baptist. Remember that moment? It's, I think, recorded in John, where John the Baptist sees the Savior coming and he testifies to the people that are his followers, that love John the Baptist, that that is the Savior. And then he says this great phrase, where it's in John 3, 30. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. To me, raising your kids unto the Lord involves a little bit of this heartbreak. It means I know that at some point, I will decrease. And my hope is that the way I've raised them and the way I've prepared them, that they will turn nowhere to turn. They will already be in that mindset and in that pattern. Because I think that's what you see with Nephi and with Lehi. Even when their dad and their mom probably, they're no longer there. They know where to turn. They know what to do. And they find the deliverance they need. Spark number two, I call the invisible battle. And for me, there were all kinds of uh, cancer illusions in this week's chapters. I know that's not normal. You guys, I think I've been traumatized a little bit by our many years of cancer experiences. But when I read about the Gadiant robbers and this sort of like disease that seems to be claiming the hearts under the surface, it just feels like cancer to me. Like it's the same idea, right? This thing that you can't see and this battle that you're fighting that you can't look at. There's no light that hits it, and it is so hard to fight. I think what's interesting is generally with cancer, there's two basic plans of attack, right? You can cut things out. Like when Jason has a very obvious tumor, we go through some intense surgeries and we cut it out, and you lose some of the surrounding tissue, but you you get the tumor out. Then you have a second option, which is this slow poisoning of your whole body to try and kill what is left of the remaining cancer cells. And both of them are good strategies, right? Usually they're used in tandem, at least in our experience. And I actually think the more I read about the Gadian robbers and this plague that is hitting the Nephite people, the more I saw Mormon almost like this expert oncologist, where he's basically saying, this evil is here and it spreads fast and you need to know how to fight it. Because honestly, I feel like he's kind of telling us that his people don't win. You know, he'll mention that in the verses this week, where he basically says that this is going to cause the overthrow of everything. If you look in Helaman 2, verse 13, it says, And behold, in the end of this book, this is Mormon speaking, you shall see that this Gadianton did prove the overthrow, yea, almost the entire destruction of the people of Nephi. I think this is Mormon telling us how bad this cancer is, that it is a lethal cancer that took out his people. 
And the reason he's teaching us that is because he wants us to guard against it. He wants us to catch it sooner so that we can perform surgeries and we can do chemo and we can do whatever is needed in order to get this cancer out. And that's what you see a little bit in 32. This is chapter six. So a few chapters further. This is where he talks about the speed of this cancer. This is a certain kind of malignancy that is fast. It says, and it came to pass that all these iniquities did come unto them in the space of not many years. This is a fast growing cancer and he wants us to be on our guard. What I love is he gives you these strategies. First, he teaches you how to cut out the disease, how to like take things out fast. This is what you see in Helaman 3, 29 and 30. Yea, we see that whosoever will lay hold upon the word of God, which is quick and powerful and shall divide asunder all the cunning and snares and wiles of the devil and lead the man of Christ in a straight and narrow course across that everlasting gulf of misery, which is prepared to engulf the wicked and land their souls, yea, their immortal souls at the right hand of God in the kingdom of heaven to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and with all our holy fathers to go no more out. This is strategy number one cut out the tumor. And the way you cut it is with this sword of truth. I actually, this is the first time reading those words that I've ever pictured it like a scalpel instead of a sword. <laughs> this is again, just my interpretation of things. Like I think this is an exact precise surgery. He's saying, when you see a problem, you cut it out. The sword of truth an understanding of scripture, the words of prophets, and personal revelation. When you take those three and you weave them together to be this pristine, sharp instrument in your hands, you can cut out disease. I think we see this with the Lamanites. You're going to see them actually cut out the disease of the Gadian robbers. Where the Nephites sort of let this malignancy grow and thrive among them, the Lamanites, they won't let it grow. They cut it out. And what they describe is that they used the word they teach the word to the Gadianton robbers and they teach it to themselves and they know. And when you know truth, you can cut out big tumors that are growing within you. What's interesting though, is especially in this chapter in three, you can see that even though they did this great cut and they got the surgery, it's not sufficient on its own. We saw this with our real cancer story. I can still remember our very first ones. This was almost eight years ago now where he had the big tumor in his pancreas and we cut that one out. And it wasn't until we got the biopsy later that we realized there was some cancer that was in the lymph nodes in the surrounding tissue. And that's when we learned we we're going to have to do chemo and a lot of other things. And I think you see that a little bit in these verses. So this is Helaman 3, 33. And in the 50 and first year of the reign of, judge, reign of the judges, there was peace also, save it were the pride which began to enter into the church, not into the church of God, but into the hearts of the people who professed to belong to the church of God. When I read that verse, it was like lymph nodes on a biopsy. It was like this little risk, right? It's this danger. At the time when we got that diagnosis after his surgery and we learned that we were, there may be a risk of spreading you had this debate, right? Do you, do you endure six months of chemo on the off chance that those could grow and spread? Or do you just see what happens? And for us, of course, we jumped into chemo because there was no chance we were going to risk that. And I feel like that's kind of what Mormon is trying to say. He's like, you can see, even though the word will get a lot of this disease out, if you still have pride in the hearts of the people, this can still grow. There is, there is something left to be done. And that's where I think you start to see his other strategy, the kind of chemo cocktail or radiation treatment that he offers. This is in 34 and 35. And they were lifted up in pride, even to the persecution of many of their brethren. Now this was a great evil, which had caused the more humble part of the people to suffer great persecutions and to wade through much affliction. Nevertheless, they did fast and pray oft and did wax stronger and stronger in their humility and firmer and firmer in the faith of Christ, unto the filling their souls with joy and consolation, yea, even to the purifying and sanctification of their hearts, which sanctification cometh because of their yielding their hearts unto God. This is the chemo cocktail to me. This is where you have this daily help. It's hard. It takes effort. It's painful even to be a disciple in these kind of circumstances where you're being oppressed and persecuted for your beliefs, especially by people who used to be of your belief. But if you persist, I think Mormon's promise is this will eradicate the disease. What you aren't able to cut out with understanding the word, you get in this diligent daily discipleship. You get that healing power in this potent combination of both. 
I think in this week's chapters, Mormon also wants us to understand the source of the disease, where this disease comes from, so that even though it destroyed his people, that we can avoid it for ours, that we can find ways to make our souls sin resistant um, and not susceptible to this type of cancer. This is what you find in Helaman 6. This is 26, 27, and also 30. And now behold, those secret oaths and covenants did not come unto Gadianton from the records which were delivered unto Helaman. But behold, they were first put into the heart of Gadianton by that same being who did entice our first parents to partake of the forbidden fruit. Yea, that same being who did plot with Cain, that if he would murder his brother Abel, it should be known unto the world, and he did plot with Cain and his followers from that time forth. And this is 30. And behold, it is he who is the author of all sin. And behold, he did carry on his works of darkness and secret murder, and doth hand down their plots and their oaths and their covenants and their plans of awful wickedness from generation to generation, according as he can get a hold on the hearts of the children of men. This is Mormon saying, this cancer is spreading and it will carry. Satan has infected the world with this particular type of disease from the very beginning, and he will do it everywhere he gets a chance. So he's inviting us to inoculate against it, to learn the word of truth, to trust in prophets, to understand how to receive revelation and act on it, and then to do these daily discipleship choices that, in, that strengthen you. The reason I like this, maybe just for me, is there's a lot of times when I feel very powerless. I used to think that cancer was something you defeated. I remember watching cancer walks and survivor stories and thinking that you could beat cancer. I don't know that I believe that anymore. I just think, I think it's kind of like the adversary. You can't really beat the adversary. You don't conquer Satan. That's Christ's job. And at some point he will indeed be conquered. But until then, you can find out how to thrive amongst his deceptions. You can find out how to live and think celestial in this very celestial world. That's what you can do. And that's what you have power to control. There's something about cancer that makes me feel powerless. But when I realize that I can control how I react to cancer and how I engage with the rest of the world when we're struggling with it, that I have power over. And I feel like that's Mormon's invitation too. He's essentially saying, this is going to continue. This disease will not be eradicated until the Savior comes again. But until then, here's what I want you to do. Here's how you can hold off the, the effects of the destroyer. I love the way it's phrased in DNC 10. So this is verse 5. Pray always that you come off conqueror, yea, that you may conquer Satan, and that you may escape the hands of the servants of Satan that do uphold his work. You are not powerless in this fight. We can't conquer or eradicate this disease, but we can choose to live our lives in a way that deflects his attacks, that makes us resistant to disease and protects the people around us. That's one of my favorite things that I learned in this week's study. Spark number three, I call the reluctant disco ball. <laughs> you may have noticed in the past, like there's a disc ball right behind my head. Violet gave me that one. I've got a few others that light up from inside. I have a thing for disco balls. Because what I love about them is that they light up the darkest circumstances, right? No matter what my house looks like or how messy things are, if I turn on a disco ball and shut the other lights off, happiness can be in the room. I just feel like they're kind of an instant brightening. And what I like about this kind of disco ball, the mirrored ones, is I really feel like that's what each of us are. I think we each have sequin covered in souls. I, I talked about this in a Time Out for Women talk last season. I, you can actually watch it on Desert Bookshelf if you want, but it's this idea of I think each of us, when we step into the path of Christ's light, it reflects off of us, even unwillingly at times. You know, I, I think it's just such a part of our nature that when that light really does hit us, it just bounces off. And the more we let that happen, the brighter that vibrant light is. And in this week's study, there's a disco ball moment. I love studying my scriptures, searching for these moments, and there's a big one in Helaman 5. This is when Nephi and Lehi are in prison. So they've been trying to reinvigorate the faith among the Nephites. They've had a lot of people come back to the church, a lot of dissenters come back to the faith. And so they decide it's time to go into Lamanite territory. And as soon as they go into Lamanite territory to try and teach, they're grabbed and they're thrown into prison. And they, for a few days, don't get any food. And things are really hard, I imagine. And when the guards come to actually try to kill them, this is when that miracle moment occurs and they're encircled by flames. You know, it's almost that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego kind of feel like they're standing in the center of flames and they are not burned and the walls around them are not burned. 
And the people that are watching are the prisoners. And there's one prisoner. It's hard to know for sure if he's a prisoner or if he's a guard, because they just call him a dissenter. And we know that there are dissenters in the prison. But if you watch the Book of Mormon video, it almost seems like he's a guard. I just don't know. In my mind, he's one of the fellow prisoners. And I see him watching. I almost see him the same way I see Peter in the New Testament after the crucifixion of the Savior when there's those three denials. I actually think there's some really interesting comparisons between those two stories. Because I picture this Aminadab, that's his name. He is a prisoner there. Who knows how long he's been there? And somehow he knows exactly who Nephi and Lehi are. He can see it. He just doesn't say that out loud just yet. So this is the encircled by fire part. This is Helaman 5, 26 and 27. And it came to pass that Nephi and Lehi did stand forth and began to speak unto them saying, fear not for behold, it is God that has shown unto you this marvelous thing in the which is shown unto you that you cannot lay your hands on us to slay us. Remember all the other prisoners are baffled by what they are seeing, but Aminadab isn't. You're going to learn that in just a few verses. He knows exactly what they're seeing. He just doesn't say anything yet. I think God is in relentless pursuit of Aminadab. And for all I know, it's the whole reason Nephi and Lehi are here in this prison at this time. This is 27. And behold, when they had said these words, the earth shook exceedingly, and the walls of the prison did shake as if they were about to tumble to the earth. But behold, they did not fall. And behold, they were in prison. They that were in prison were Lamanites and Nephites who were dissenters. This one particular prisoner, Aminadab, is the one that catches my eye. I don't know his backstory. Nobody does. It's not written in the verses. But I found myself wondering, he clearly knows the gospel. You're going to hear that soon. He must have been raised by a mother like Hannah or a mother like the stripling warriors. In fact, sometimes I wonder if maybe he is a stripling warrior and he sees these grandsons of Helaman, you know, come in and he recognizes that light, even if it's been decades since he believed it himself. I don't know. That's just my supposition, but here's how it plays out in the story. So a voice comes, they hear a voice calling them to repentance and this thick darkness covers these prisoners and no one can see through it except Aminadab. So listen for this. So in, this is 5 verse 30. And it came to pass that when they heard this voice and beheld that it was not a voice of thunder, neither was it a voice of great tumultuous noise, but behold, it was a still voice of perfect mildness, as if it had been a whisper, and it did pierce even to the very soul. That word pierce is what sparked for me this time, because I think this is happening to Aminadab, maybe to a bunch of others, but the Lord is like, piercing this shell that has built up over years of Aminadab's life, where he has dissented away from the faith. He's left the covenant. He's got this hard shell. But when you stand in this kind of light, when you see someone like Nephi and Lehi, when you hear a voice of thunder that is perfectly mild, it pierces even the hardest shell. And that's what happens. What's interesting to me is he doesn't respond. He knows what this is. I think he recognizes it. But kind of like Peter, he doesn't, I wouldn't say he physically denies, he just doesn't step up. Not on the first time, not on the second time. The voice comes again, speaks again, then we'll all shake again, and Aminadab is still quiet. I just wish I could hear more of the backstory. By the third time, the voice is stronger, and this time it's speaking words that nobody else can even utter. Like, that's how powerful these words are. This is the relentless pursuit that I picture. This is the Lord saying, I am not leaving without you. I think the Lord wants to snatch Aminadab and probably every other man in that prison, because they've probably given up on life in a hundred different ways, and they don't think they deserve a miracle, and here's where they are, right? And this is what happens with Aminadab. He gets pierced all these times, and then he can't hold back anymore. This is Helaman 5.32. Now there was one among them who was a Nephite by birth, who had once belonged to the church of God, but had dissented from them. And it came to pass that he turned him about, and behold, he saw through the cloud of darkness the faces of Nephi and Lehi, where nobody else can see, he can see. And the, behold, they did shine exceedingly even as the faces of angels. And he beheld that they did lift their eyes to heaven and that they were in the attitude as if talking or lifting their voice to some being who they beheld. This is when I think Aminadab has been pierced so many times by the spirit that is in this room that he can't hold back anymore. He can see things no one else can see. The covenant is coming back. That's how I see this. I, again, I'm just projecting a lot, but I could see his parents praying for him for decades, you know, that he will come back, that he will find his way back. And in this moment, the Lord finds him and it pierces his heart and he 
is igniting again. His testimony that has been cold for so long rekindles. Remember we studied that quote from President Eyring where he said that it never goes out. That spark never goes out. It's what it means to be a child of the covenant. It just needs the proper circumstances and it can be fanned into a flame. That's what happens in this week's chapters. Look at Helaman 5, 41. Aminadab said unto them, you must repent. Remember, all the people in the prison are terrified. They don't understand what's happening. They don't recognize these things from their previous life. This is new to them, but Aminadab knows. So he says, you must repent and cry in, and cry unto the voice, yea, even until you shall find faith in Christ, who was taught unto you by Alma and Amulek and Zeezrom. And when you shall do this, the cloud of darkness shall be removed from overshadowing you. I just think this is him snatched. Like he is Alma the Younger in this moment where he was way off course and now he's seen the light again and he recognizes it and he remembers how warm it is. And because he chooses to speak in this moment, it opens up, not just for Aminadab, but for everyone else. It's one thing to see a miraculous thing. It's another thing to have a fellow prisoner or a fellow dissenter teach you what's in their heart and say, I know exactly what this is. I know who these men are and I know who they're speaking to. This is, this is what you need to do. You need to call upon the name of Christ. And they all do. Amenadab in this moment becomes the disco ball where he was looking at Nephi and Lehi as this glorious light. Now he becomes this disco ball that shines out to all those other prisoners and they believe him and they pray to God. Probably for the first time in their lives, they pray to God. And in that moment, the light encircles them. This is one of my favorite parts is when the, the fire spreads, instead of just centering around Le Lehi and Nephi, it encircles all 300 of those prodigals. All of them at once experience this beautiful miracle. This is how it's phrased. Helaman 5, 46 and 47. And it came to pass that there came a voice unto them, yea, a pleasant voice, as if it were a whisper saying, peace, peace be unto you because of your faith in my well-beloved who was from the foundation of the world. I think this is him putting this balm on Aminadab's heart and every other prodigal in that prison, that he understands that where they are and he knows how far afield they have gone and he's right here and he will not leave this prison without them. It is this glorious, soothing moment. To me, the reason I see this kind of similar to Peter is when I think about Peter's denial phase, and there's a question, right, about whether he denied to protect the apostles or whether he really did deny to protect himself. Regardless, I imagine that phase between the denials and when he encounters the Savior again is excruciating to Peter's soul. And we don't have the first words that Peter and the Savior exchanged after the resurrection, but we do have that sweet moment on the Sea of Galilee. And I love that in that moment, that first exchange that we do have written down, it's the Lord asking Peter, do you love me? And if you love me, feed my sheep. Like that's what he invites Peter to do. The reason I think it's so beautiful with this chapter is because that's essentially what Aminadab will do as well. If you go to 50 of verse five or chapter five, this is what you find. And it came to pass that they did go forth and did minister unto the people, declaring throughout all the regions round about all the things which they had heard and seen, insomuch that the more part of the Lamanites were convinced of them because of the greatness of the evidences which they had received. These 300 men, these prisoners and prodigals and dissenters turn into mighty missionaries for God. And they were able to set down all their guilt and all their mistakes and all their history and start fresh. And I just think there is something so powerful about that kind of disco ball moment. Someone who has fresh eyes to see himself and to see God and to see the people around him that kind of disco ball you can't look away from. And I love that you see it in this week's chapters. All right, you guys, time for the questions. Okay, my first question comes from Helaman 3, verse 30. This is right on the heels of that verse from Mormon where he talks about grabbing hold of the sword of truth, basically, and that we can use it to divide asunder the tricks of the adversary. And then he makes this promise. He basically informs us that if we do those things, and we do the best we can, and we turn to Christ, that we'll have this promise of sitting with people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob on the right hand of God and all the other holy fathers. And then there's this phrase, it says, and to go no more out. And I'm curious what you think that means. I've actually seen it a few times in scripture. I've marked it in a few different places. I have some theories, but I wonder what you think it means to go no more out. Is it a state of progression? Is it a location? What do you think that refers to? 
Okay, Helaman 5.8 is my second question. This is when Helaman is urging his sons to set aside the things of the world and lay up for themselves treasures in heaven. And this is kind of an obvious question, but I'm hoping it promotes some really good discussion with your kids or with your families. I want to know what you think heavenly treasure is and how do you lay it up? I have some theories on this. Like, I, You could see heavenly treasure as relationships. You could see heavenly treasure as a rate of progression that you get to, that you start to progress at this certain kind of pace. I think you can even see it as a certainty of some kind. I, I don't know exactly what I would call it, but I'm wanting to know what your thoughts are. What do you think treasures in heaven are and how do you lay them up? Okay, third question. This comes from that last chapter, Helaman 6. This is around 36 to 38 or so. This is where you learn that the Nephites and the Lamanites have treated this cancer of the Gadian robbers very differently. The Lamanites have chosen to preach to the Gadian robbers, and those who won't listen and convert, they get rid of, and the Nephites let them live. In fact, it seems like they almost encourage and embrace the the Gadianton robbers as they kind of infiltrate their society and come into their government. In fact, in the verses, it says that the Nephites build them up and support them until they come down to believe in their works and partake of their spoils. It's almost that Lahontai principle playing out for us here. They first kind of embrace these evil tendencies and allow them to to happen and then they start to actually take on those beliefs for themselves and participate in the spoils. I just thought that was such an interesting turn of phrase. So my question is, do you see similar trends in our day where we are, as a people, starting to embrace things that will ultimately destroy truth? And my question is, what does this look like? Mormon often calls it, they are ripening for destruction. Where do you see that in our day? And probably more importantly, what can we do to reverse that trend? Especially from this week's chapters, what do you feel like we as a people can do to reverse the trend of allowing evil to kind of infiltrate into our societies? What do you think we can do? Okay, those are my three questions. I'll go get your scriptures and go find out what you can see in the verses. Before we head into the object lessons, let me give you one more thought. Um, I think one of the most resounding messages I got this week was the power of the word I think you hear from Mormon's commentary, you hear Helaman's words captured in the hearts of his sons, you see their testimony change the hearts of all the people in that prison. There is power in the word, and I think we want to learn how to wield it better. One of my favorite verses about the word comes from Psalms. This is Psalm 119, 105. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I can remember singing that with my sisters as we were like around a piano singing Amy Grant's version of that verse. And it's always kind of hung with me. What I like about it is I feel like what he's giving us is just enough light to light our path. It's not going to be a bright, vibrant light that illuminates everything around us and makes choices clear and easy. He gives us light that is a lamp to our feet. To me, that's about the same amount of light that I could get from my phone, right? It's it's not going to illuminate a whole space. It's just enough for me to take a few more gutsy steps forward. And I think that's what you see in this week's verses. You see those who hold tight to the word. The word meaning the word of God that's written in scripture, professed by prophets, and taught through personal revelation. And also the word meaning the Savior himself. Those who fully embrace that have spiritual power. And it allows them to accomplish things they could never accomplish on their own. There's this great quote in the notes. I, I didn't put the full one here, but let me tell you a little bit of what, what Elder Holmes taught in 2020. He said, These words are more than ink on a page, sound waves in our ears, thoughts in our minds, or feelings in our hearts. The word of God is spiritual power, is truth and light. It is how we hear him. The word initiates and increases our faith in Christ and fuels us fuels us with a desire to become more like our Savior, that is to repent and to walk the covenant path. What I liked about Elder Holmes' perspective on this is I think what he's saying is as you take a few steps forward in the light that you have so far, that will actually fuel your battery. Like It will keep that light on and make it brighter and brighter so that you can take a few more gutsy steps forward. And the promise is if you stay on that plan, you keep that path and you keep using that light to light your way that you'll get where you need to go. He promises the illumination you need just in the moments you need it. And I think you see that in this week's chapters. 